So how big is your um, company these days? Good. In terms of it's a very, very exciting time to be, just in general, to be in the AI space and, and anything related to vector embeddings. But also for us as a company, and I'll, I'll go over then one of the slides in a second. It's it's a very interesting time to sort of where, where everyone's moving into production and that comes with completely different challenges, but also with completely new opportunities. So it's it's a very exciting time. That's great, yeah. Well, certainly, yeah. Can, can you maybe also give me like a 30 second or so intro to this course? Maybe what what other topics have you talked about to, to set the, the context with? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. So and, and I can I can do it now. So this course is a graduate uh, seminar. Uh, we have, um, I think, 30 students uh, at the moment. Uh, we have some senior undergraduates, uh, definitely most of the master's students and a few PhD students. Uh, so it's a seminar on database systems. So it's not an AI course. Uh, it's really coming at it from a database point of view. And we've been looking at the intersection of database systems and artificial intelligence and how database techniques can support AI applications and in the other direction, how AI uh, methods, techniques can help with some interesting data challenges. So certainly a vector databases is something that we have seen before. Uh, we had a couple of guest speakers as well. Uh, we've been looking at large language models and how we can leverage large language models uh, to help with some canonical data problems like information extraction, data cleaning, stuff like that. Um, and also we've been looking at how we can uh, accelerate uh, large language models, especially when you combine it with uh, retrieval augmented generation. Uh, and then we have also been looking at just pure uh, machine learning approaches, deep learning, and so on, and how we can, again, use them for various uh, database problems. For example, after your lecture, uh, we have two uh, student presentations. One will be on using machine learning to, do, to accelerate sorting. Um, and then the other one is to use deep learning to do natural language to SQL translation. Really cool. Perfect. Yeah, I think Weave 8 will, will definitely fit right in. So this talk is definitely going to be more on the sort of databases for AI side, but actually the AI for databases is also something that we're super interested in just to see like new usage patterns and how the whole interaction um, with, with databases changes. There's a, a podcast recording with Andy Pavlo and Bob, the other co-founder of Weave 8, where they go into, into that topic. So for anyone interested in, in that, that's already my, my first cross sell to another talk. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, I'll take a look at, if I can't find it, um, maybe I can ask you to give me a link, but uh, I certainly would like to distribute that to the students in the class. Yeah. Okay, so I think, uh, are you ready, Etienne? Yeah, when, whenever you are ready. Okay, great. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, so uh, we're gonna, as usual, we're gonna start with a guest lecture. And I'm delighted to introduce Etienne Dylocker today. Uh, Etienne is the C CTO and co-founder of this, you know, very popular uh, vector database system called Vivid. And so he's going to be talking to us about uh, himself a little bit first, and then his company, and then talk to us about some of the interesting features. And in particular, uh, I think uh, Etienne is going to be talking about quantization a very important technique that underlies scalability for vector databases. So with that, I'll turn it over to you at the end. Thank you, Rory. Thank you for, for having me. Yeah, I I'm, I'm also feel very honored to, to be able to do this, and I hope I can give you a nice sort of deep dive into some of the topics in, in Weave 8. Um, very quickly about me, um, as you just heard, I, I co-founded um, we be eight about four and a half years ago. I think I keep saying four and a half at some point, it's going to be five. I think we might actually be closer to five than, than four and a half by now. Um, my background was mainly in building production grades, great apps. So there's definitely the, the scaling aspect, um, mainly sort of around the, the cloud native uh, space. So I kind of grew up with Kubernetes in a sense. Um, it's not entirely true, but the Kubernetes played a a large role in uh, the stuff that I did before uh, founding Weeb8. Interestingly, no formal background in AI. So um, AI really just wasn't 
a thing and and of course it was but no one called it ai and, and it wasn't sort of a typical thing that you would study when i went to school databases definitely were um i did not ever think that i would be the one building a database for me a database was always just something that you use um but of course even just using it gives you a lot of ideas or if the whole uh, no SQL versus SQL was sort of the same thing that we right now we see in AI native databases versus the rest. So that was that was more back then. Um, yeah, my talks tend to be very very tech focused. So you're not going to see like this is probably the most salesy slide in in all of the talk. Um, love to focus on specific deep tech topics, and um, I'll go over why I chose quantization for this in a in a second. Uh, quickly about WeV8. I hope I, I can wait. I can see some of you. So for, for those of you in the in the room, can you raise your hand if you've either heard of or better even used WeV8 before? Okay. Wow. Cool. Cool. Quite some hands going up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we we founded this in 2019. Bob is sort of was sort of the the other half, the other co-founder. Um, by now, over 65 people, so it's grown <laughs> quite a bit. We've raised um, about 50 million uh, for a Series B last year in in April have at the moment um, about a thousand customers over various sort of different different areas and four million open source downloads. So the whole WeV8 stack is, is open source. You can just spin it up on your local machine or you can, can have it hosted by us. Uh, one thing that sets us apart is we often hear that we're the most enterprise ready. And that's, that's something very subjective that can be as simple as just the kind of language we use when we interact with, with our customers. It can be specific feature set um, but one thing that also is very critical for enterprise uh, is just the cost at scale, because you can you can have a fascinating tech case, but if there's no business case behind it, then yeah, that case is not ever going to go to into production. And that is kind of the the segue into oh, I can't switch slides. Let me see. Oh, I can click um, into the whole topic of of quantization. We're looking at this in the context of cost reduction, what can we do to, to reduce costs? It's only one of the many things we do on, on cost reduction, but it's a very a significant one. And last year in in fall, I did a guest lecture at CMU and then sort of the question was like, okay, what can I do? I kind of wanted to make this a part two of that lecture, but also didn't want to make the other one a, a, a prerequisite for this. And I thought like quantization is something that I briefly touched upon in the previous one, just on product quantization. And so much has happened since then, both on our side, but also in the whole research community. And I thought like, okay, let's do just sort of four quantization techniques. And you'll see that not all of them are, are actually implemented in WeV8 right now, but I wanted to make it more about the techniques rather than about, but WeV8, some are, some are coming. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just wanted to, to give some sort of a, a knowledge sharing walkthrough. Um, so you saw we have a couple of folks internally from, from uh, WeV8 also on the call. So this is kind of designed to be very selfishly also that we could potentially reuse it for, for knowledge sharing uh, purposes. Um, yeah, and then we're, we're trying to reserve some time at the end for Q&A. Um, but also if there's a question during, I, I don't mind being interrupted. Like if you have a question that you think fits, feel, feel free to just ask it. Cool, so um, motivation. So this slide is technically, this is outdated, but I haven't really updated it for a specific purpose. This has some models that are wildly used or sorry, widely used in, in uh, production right now, um, even though they're not the latest anymore. And the reason I've used the, the OpenAI ADA2 here is because I have some examples later on that make use of exactly this model. The Cohere one is just, larger in size, so it fits kind of well. There's also newer models from Cohere out, but it fits, fits very well. And then I even I used a, an, an open source one from Esper, that's a shout out to Niels Reimers. He, he runs this side, he works for Cohere now, but he, he um, runs this side that has some open source models on it, which is kind of the smallest on this, this slide. And really what I wanna show is if you have a say 1536 dimensional vector and one vector is represented by, or one dimension is represented by a float 32, that's already six kilobytes for a single vector. And then if you have a million of them, that's six gigabyte of them. And if you have a billion of them, it's six terabyte and so on. I guess you can extrapolate that your, yourself. But uh, kind of the, the overarching thing here is like, that's a lot of memory, especially if we do want to run all of this in, in memory. And can we do something to reduce the memory footprint and therefore make it more scalable and also make it more cost-effective? This statement in a sense is almost a bit controversial because 
first of all, it just assumes that vector storage runs in memory. That is not always true. That is one specific case. Uh, there are lots of, so for example, with um, running multi-tenant cases where you have multiple smaller distinct uh, 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 vector sets or data sets, it's way easier to do this in a, for example, more separation of storage and compute kind of kind of uh, mechanism where you don't just have this like global thing that's constantly in memory. But there are cases, especially sort of more single tenant, more large scale, um, and then also if if uh, latency and throughput requirements come come into play, there are scenarios where we have to run it into memory, and this is kind of where the quantization techniques that we're going to talk about um, offer the most value. So for those of you who've never heard of quantization before, um, this is, I actually looked this up um, just a couple of days ago when I created those slides, the Wikipedia definition. I was like, oh, should have probably looked this up sooner at some point. That, that makes a lot of sense. So quantization is the process of constraining an input from a continuous, otherwise large data set of values, such as real numbers, to a discrete set. And then what we're really trying to do here is we want to have a discrete set that is also smaller in its memory footprint um, in the context of a vector databases. To start out with scalar quantization. So depending on the kind of person you are, maybe you can just look at that formula and be like, oh, okay, that's scalar quantization. Great. No, no, I know it. I'm not that kind of person. I'm a very sort of practical, visual, hands-on kind of learner. And looking at this just scares me away. But it's actually super simple what's in that in that formula. Um, but I need this, I need this more tangible. And one of those examples to make this a bit more tangible is if we're talking about converting an analog to a dig digital signal. So think of a, a handheld microphone, and then you, you have sound waves coming into that microphone, and this needs to be converted into a digital signal. Like the, the, the original source is completely unpredictable, that the amplitude can, can vary, the, the frequency can vary, you just have this, this sort of continuous uh, unpredictable signal. And in the digital world, we don't have these kind of things. Like we, we need somehow we need to to map this to to bits in the end, to to bits and bytes. And um, a vector is not an analog signal, but in a sense, the same thing applies. So if you think of a, a vector represented as a float thirty two, you have almost an infinite. Of course, not an infinite. It's it's there's only so many values that you can have in a in a float thirty two, but it's a very large range of values that you can have per dimension and then times 1536 dimension, that's like a lot of a lot of uh, possible values. And if we wanted to convert this sort of analog system into a dig digital system uh, signal, then what we could do is we could define sort of a, a step size where we say, okay, we're, we're kind of approximating this curve with specific steps. And these steps are, um, but the step size is something to be defined obviously. And this is also where the quality of the quantization uh, goes up or down if you design them or, or define them better or worse. But the, the overarching idea is um, basically, okay, we're, we're going to approximate this. And obviously this is lossy. We've, this, this curve doesn't match the other curve exactly. Um, but we're trying to do this in a way where we can retain as much information and uh, keep the, the memory footprint or the data footprint uh, down. So how do we pick those step size? So Something that you very often do in this case is just you pick a, a round number. And what I mean by round is a, a power of two, really. And, and especially if it's sort of, um, if it fits in a byte. So if you have 256 distinct values, that's perfect because then you can just use one byte. And this is something that, um, yeah, makes it much easier for, for computers to, uh, to also perform math on this. And then the other thing that we need to do is we somehow need to normalize that range because well, a float, the maximum value of a float can be massive and the minimum value of a float is basically just the same with a different sign. Um, so we have this potentially massive range, but most likely our vector embeddings or, or analog signal is only somewhere in that range. So what we do is we, we just normalize this based on the, on the upper limit and based on the lower limit of values. And then we say, okay, this is our range. And then within that range, we want to have a certain step size. So this is kind of the, the right half of that formula where it just says exactly that upper minus lower, and then the two to the power of B, that's just our, our bit size. So that's two to the eight powers, um, 256 options minus one. And then in a very practical example, um, I, I've taken, and, and all, of, all of my examples that I have are always based on this DBpedia 100K data set, which is um, vectorized with OpenAI 
embeddings add on two. So that's why I didn't update the previous slide to the latest model because the data set out there that I used is based on, on this model. It's a publicly available data set. And I just wanted to quantize the first 10 dimensions of the first vector just to see what that looks like, to get a bit of a, a feel for it. And then what you see here is exactly that. You have the, the original continuous floating point vector, which is yeah, sort of numbers that seem to be more or less centered around zero. Um, if there are or not, that's, that's up for debate for now. Um, and then what comes out is um, an int eight um, with just 255 distinct values. So we could kind of get this, um, the, the screen real estate is actually smaller, um, but of course the memory footprint would also be if, if the first numbers are float 32s and the, the second numbers would be um, just end dates or actually U end dates in, in, in that case. Here's some code just to sort of prove that this really is a real thing, a real experiment that we ran. And you see, this is not very complex code. It's essentially just what we had on the, on the previous slide. Um, I did want to show this because what we have in the in the top here, this global upper and global lower, this could be a bit of a foreshadowing that maybe there is something that we could still improve around this. But for now, this is just scalar quantization. So um, this is essentially the the very simple code um, that just it, it's just the formula that we had on the first slide in in Python code. Terrible idea, by the way, to do this in Python. Does not scale at all, but just for for um, the sake of of um, proving the concept, <laughs> it was it was okay. But just the hundred k in that data set, brute forcing this already took a long time. Probably went past the point where I should have just rebuilt this in a more efficient language multiple times. Um, if you then want to calculate a distance with a quantized vectors, you basically just reverse it. Um, obviously, this is lossy because we've we've lost. Sure, if we fit the continuous values into so many specific steps. Uh, but it is reversible. It is reversible just with with a slightly slower accuracy. You just take the quantized dimension, multiply it by the step size, and then you take that offset, which was the the lower bound. You can also sort of if you compare, and typically this is what you do in similarity search, you compare two different vector values. What you can do is you can pre-calculate the constants because they never change in this example. The upper and the lower bound were the same for the entire data set. And similar for the offset, so you can sort of move this around a bit. That in the end, all you're really comparing is the these two int values, or all that you're multiplying is these two int values if you're calculating a, a dot product. And you can pre-calculate these these constants, and then it becomes a bit more efficient. So the interesting question now is with the with the lossiness, how does our quality? What is our quality uh, um, going to be like after this? And as I said before, all of these experiments are ran on the the OpenAI. DBpedia 100k data set, which comes with 500 uh, query vectors, and then I'm doing a brute force search on them. So quick side note, um, typically you don't do brute force searches in vector databases. Um, I think HNSW is by now sort of a, um, a commonly understood concept, and I tried to, to not make this sort of yet another introduction to HNSW uh, uh, talk. Um, the quantization techniques, you can apply them to approximate nearest neighbor indexes such as HNSW, but just for the sake of getting a neutral comparison in this uh, experiment, I just use brute force search anywhere because then we don't have this, this um, both the approximate parts of the index and of the quantization technique, because then also the question becomes, how well does this particular technique actually work with that particular index? So for now to get sort of a, a um, sort of more objective comparison, I'm just brute forcing them. Um, but in reality, sometimes we would brute force them if the index is small enough. Sometimes we would use them with A and N indexes such as uh, HNSW. So long story short, we ended up with 95.2% recall in, in this experiment. And this is in a sense, so first of all, this shows that probably the amount of dimensions in there are somewhat just, justified. We couldn't just sort of quantize this and end up with 100% recall. So that's good in a sense. That means the model makers did this for a reason. Um, the other part is whether 95 is higher or low depends a bit on your context and what you're trying to achieve. For an end-to-end -end case, I would say it's rather low, but this is the other big disclaimer for, for every single one of those, um, those experiments, it's always just the raw 
quantization calculation, what you can always do is you can always overfetch and rescore. So you could take, say, if you're looking for the top 10 results, you could take the top 100 and rescore those top 100 with the um, with the original embedding. So especially in the database context where you have a disk available and everything's on disk, this is great. This is something you can do. And this actually gets the recall. We'll see this later. This gets the recall up way higher. But again, just for comparing the different techniques, I'm just looking at the raw un uh unrescored <laughs> sort of just the 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 raw um distance calculation with the quantization method. So that's our first baseline. Actually, I guess our first baseline would have been 100 percent if we just used the original vector embeddings, but out of the four quantization techniques, uh, 95 percent is our, our first baseline. So we've uh, sort of pros and cons. I have this for for all four techniques. Um, we have a 4x reduction. This is technically not a fixed thing, but then in practice, it also kind of is. And the reason I'm saying this is you can use as many bits as you want or as few bits as you want, um, but four is really the sweet spot. It, it The quality drops quite a bit if you go sort of, um, if you go to 8x, I have this on, on the bottom right of the slide, uh, the recall drops to 29%. So four is kind of the common scenario for scalar quantization. Great thing is that doing math on ints is way more efficient than floats, so this is actually faster. The recall is pretty decent, and of course we can always rescore it. Um, it is also simple math for the quantization itself. So all that we have to do is basically do this this global normalization, and then we just have to apply this very simple sort of um, um, divided by the step size and add the offset to it. So this is if you have to quantize a billion vectors, this is not too much time uh, compared to other things like yeah indexing time into onto disks etc and similarly if so if for any quantization technique that is somehow fitted to the data set a data drift is always a topic like what if you fit this on your first 100,000 top 100,000 vector embeddings but then you import 900,000 more and they have a completely different distribution since the math to quantize it was relatively cheap the math to adjust it is also relatively cheap. And the good thing is it can be done independently. Like you don't have to have the entire data set in, in memory to do it. You could do it um, one step at a time. On uh, the cons, sort of because we take global minimum and global maximum values, this can skew the entire distribution a bit and which could then have an impact on recall. We'll see this in a second. Um, it is fit to the data set, but also only minimally. So this is kind of the downside of the cheap fitting map. Um, it doesn't fit the data set perfectly. And yeah, what I said before, you can try to quantize more aggressively. We're not in any way restricted to using um, this, this 4x sort of from float 32 into, uh, into end 8, but the quality drops quite a bit. So in practice, it's kind of 4x. Oh yeah, important one. I <laughs> also have these for all four. So scalar quantization is something that exists in the VV8 open source uh, repository. You could use it right now if you build it yourself, but it's not publicly released yet. So this is something that's that's coming soon. Next one, locally adaptive. This is probably my favorite, um, probably because for me, it's the, the newest one that I learned about. Um, the, the underlying idea is that embeddings that have been created by deep learning models often have specific patterns. And can we somehow use those patterns to our advantage? Can we essentially fit our quantization, not generically to a data set, but really specifically to the kind of data set we, we have at hand? And for this, the first thing that we want to look at is just the min and max values per vector. So um, you saw that on the previous slide in, in scalar quantization, we just took the global maximum. But here, if we look at different vectors, and these were completely randomly picked, except for the green one. The green one is the one that has the, the smallest range. So I wanted to have this extreme on there, and then a few others that are closer to the, the global um, upper and, and lower boundary. And as you can see, if we have our, our quantization steps evenly distributed across this whole range from, what is it, minus uh, 0 0.7 to, to 0.3, then that will fit okay for some vector embeddings, but for the green one, actually, it, it makes only use of about half of the values. So the 
the idea here is that the learning is, well, not every vector uses the exact same range of the values. So if we could somehow have this different per vector, there is a chance that we could increase the, the overall accuracy. And then what about dimensions? So this is this is very interesting. So I was quite happy when I ran this experiment to see that there are these drastic outliers, and you can run this yourself on the on the um, DBpedia uh, set. There are about four dimensions or so that are strong outliers. I took the first one uh, that is an outlier, which is the the hundred ninety fifth, um, and what you see is the mean for all of this dimension. So this is kind of the other way around. Now this is per dimension, but the mean across the entire data set. The mean typically centers around zero. They're all very, very close to, to zero. And then there are these outliers where in this case it's minus 0 0.6, which is super, super close almost to one of the extreme values. So this is probably where the, the overall low point comes from. It's probably from some value in this, this dimension. Uh, and then the, the boxes around these points is kind of the, the min max range just for this, this dimension. So next learning, not every dimension is centered around the same point. So again, if we could center our steps sort of relative to that mean, we could use the steps that we have more efficiently overall, which then again, in theory, should improve our, our recall. And, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was the wrong one. So these are exactly the kind of concepts that locally adaptive quantization, which is um, coming from a, from a paper by, by Intel or by a few folks that, that work for, for Intel, by the way, and the first concept is if we center our vectors around the mean of that specific dimension and, and just sort of quantize the delta to that mean, then we have, or, or, or yeah, the, 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 no, then that's the thing. <laughs> center the vectors around the means and then define the upper and lower boundaries relative to that mean, which we saw in the previous slide makes a lot, a lot of sense. And the second concept is instead of these global upper and lower values, we take the min and max per vector. Applying this sort of, again, our, I want to say pseudocode, it's not pseudocode, it's just Python. Um, it, we have the same quantization function we had before, and then we have this locally ad adaptive quantizer, uh, which uses, yeah, gets one vector, gets the upper value, which is pre-computed for that vector, gets the lower value, and then just put those in the in the delta function, and the value that we're using is the offset to the the means. And of course, the upper and lower values were also calculated um, as the the delta to the mean. If we do all of this, good things happen. So same data set, same kind of setup. Again, brute force, everything the same, and we're now at ninety nine point four two percent recall compared to the ninety five point point two that we had with scalar quantization. So this is this is pretty good. Like this is the level of we don't even need to rescore this good. If we're using this in the context of say an approximate nearest neighbor index, these are kind of the areas that we want to get to. So so this is I was quite impressed running this on that that data set for for the first time, uh, especially compared to yeah to to scalar quantization. There are more concepts in the paper that just. For, for the sake of keeping this brief, uh, I just want to very quickly talk about them. One concept in the paper is that's maybe less interesting for a database, but more in interesting for uh, a performance benchmark. You can actually do a two-stage quantization where you run the first set, uh, only use a couple of bits for the first run, and then use the, the remainder, sort of quantize this again with the remaining bits. Um, the overall memory footprint is the same, but it's faster because you can do sort of a first stage ranking with uh, with fewer bits, and then you do the, the second, which is sort of a re-ranking or a re-scoring, just not with the continuous vectors, where the paper mentions the idea of like, if you want to keep this in memory, it's pointless if you have to read the full dimensional vectors again, because then your memory footprint is just the same as it was before, or you have to do it, you have to read it from disk, but then you can't maximize throughput anymore. In the database context, ma maximizing throughput in the context of a benchmark is often not real topic, what we want to do is kind of get a trade-off somewhere like a nice balance in between cost reduction and, and performance. And their re-ranking with the full continuous vectors is definitely a thing. Um, yeah, and the other concept, I think we also already quickly mentioned this in, in the context of just regular scalar quantization is because it was so cheap to build, it's also very cheap to, to um, 
adjust in case the data drifted. So we just need to figure out the new means and adjust the uppers and lowers, which is relatively simple to do. So pros and cons. We got considerably better recall than scalar quantization. And spoiler alert, this is going to be the best recall we see in in um, out of all four techniques, especially before rescoring. There is potential for better performance with this multi-stage approach that we just talked about. It's a good compromise between performance and memory reduction. It's not super drastic. So we're still kind of looking at the same, typically 4x. The paper mentions that you can go down to like 6x and still get a good accuracy. So it's it's roughly similar, like slightly better possibly than scalar quantization, but in the same order of magnitude. Um, and yeah, it's still relatively cheap to, to quantize. Um, Cons, this is almost not a real downside, but um, yeah, we lose a bit of that that ability to pre-compute some stuff because of course all of our uppers and lowers are now dynamic. They're they're no longer global variables that we can just pre-compute for the entire data set, but they actually vary depending on uh, what vectors you're comparing to. And then compared to the pure scalar quantization, we actually have to store two more values, the lower and upper boundary. Again, not a massive downside because this is just two additional float values um, per per vector embedding. Locally adaptive quantization in WeV8 is something that we're researching right now. So um, this kind of made it into this talk because we're researching it. And then I thought, like, hey, this is also a great opportunity for me. We, we have in, in WeV8, we have sort of a, a team that basically works exactly on researching these kind of things, but then also bringing them to production. Um, but this talk was also a good excuse for me to also play around with it, with it a bit and try to really understand the the concept. Um, but yeah, is there's a there's a just because it's it's so great, <laughs> there's a high likelihood that this will end up in in WeV8 soon. The third one, product quantization. Okay, so yeah. Um, yes. Can you me? Yeah. I had a question. Um, sure. Given that this quantization uh, techniques, especially the local aware one, is so effective, does it also mean that there's a lot of room for improvements in terms of the quality of the embeddings people generate? Because you can really, in some ways, compress it down to a much smaller footprint while still having the same type of semantic richness uh, in it. Uh, I'm wondering if the same type of logic is applied during the training phase when you're actually creating the embeddings. Uh, how would that look like? Excellent question. Uh, there is actually something on putting the quantization step right into the model on a on a later slide. Um, I, I completely agree. I, I think the the amount of dimensions that the model uh, creators use are somewhat arbitrary. So often in the in the early benchmarks, we could see that a, a a lower dimensional model would actually outcompete the higher dimensional model. Um, and it's, I think the, the the earliest, in the earliest days, it was just about accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. It doesn't matter what the cost is. It was just, how can we get the most accurate model? And I think this led to this very generous use of, of dimensions. So completely agreed. If we can do this so well, after the fact, then there's a very high chance that you can also do this in the model. And I actually have something on that um, later when we talk about binary quantization. Actually, just to follow up on yep. that, I know I'm slowing you down a bit, but um, so when you compute recall, that is computed relative to the original model, right? And that's not how things work in traditional information retrieval. Typically, the ground truth comes from the assessment of the human experts, not from another model or metric. And what this tells me is that maybe actually the smaller the quantized model might actually be closer to what the human experts may think. In other words, the, the computation of you know recall is also based on the sort of the assumption that the, the, the original model, the larger model, always gives you better results, which may actually not be true. Yeah, that, that is a very, very good point. So maybe I, I should have probably defined recall up front, but exactly as you just said, recall in this context is just compared to the, the brute force on the continuous vector embeddings. But that is a very good point. End-to-end -end doesn't necessarily mean that this is 
this is exactly what the user sees as as better. So great point. Cool uh, product quantization, the the third one of the the bunch. Uh, product quantization is the oldest one that we have in in Wev8, and I think it's to some degree it's the most versatile one, which we'll we'll see in a second. Um, but it's it's also a bit more complex in its in its training phase. It's not super complex, but it's it's sort of more than just a, a, a bit of um, offset and and defining a step size. And the underlying concept between uh, or under or for for PQ is clustering. So what we see here is this Voronoi diagram, which is essentially we've clustered the data into, I think this is a bit arbitrary, into 19 or so different points. These are the, the white dots. And then for every vector, so let's just assume a two-dimensional vector in this case, for every vector, it's closest to one of those dots. And these are the kind of areas, and then you get this, this nice uh, kind of shape. And we can use these. So if we, if we just label them, with uh, numbers, so in this case, I said it's it's 19 from zero to, to 18, um, then we can make use of those for, for our quantization. In reality, of course, this is not going to be 19, but it will be, it will be um, again, sort of a, a round number, a, a power of two. So how, how can we use them? If we just, if we were to just assign our vector embeddings to some of those 19 or 256 cluster points, well, we'd lose a lot of accuracy because that's not a lot of options anymore. For well, maybe if we have two hundred and fifty-six documents and they're perfectly distributed, then yes. Um, but that is not what we do in product quantization. What we do is we actually split this up into different segments. And for now, let's just assume a segment correlates exactly with a dimension. And then what we do is for every one of those segments, we actually try to find out okay, which is the closest looking at the same dimension of, of our, our original vectors that we used to, to create the clusters, which is the same cluster. So again, we're ending up with a sort of different, distinct numerical ID. This time it's not a continuous one. This one is just a specific segment. So for these values, you would end up with say, say segment ID 37, 200, four, and then third one is, or the last one is uh, 37 again. Um, this already gives you a 4x reduction because again, we're replacing a float 32 value with a, in this case, u and 8 value. So again, sort of going from four bytes to one byte, as you can see on the, on the right. So the short four dimensional vector would turn into these four bytes. So from, um, yeah, 32 to four, no, sorry, from 16 to, to four bytes. But we can take this one step further we could actually, since we just use these sub vectors right now, we use a sub vector of length one to find the closest segment. What if we use longer sub vectors? We could use a sub vector of, of two dimensions, for example. Then the concept is exactly the same. We're, we're again doing a similarity search. In this case, not one number to another number, but a vector of length two to other vectors of length two that sort of match these same, these same positions. And then again, we, we end up with a segment ID and what we see now is all of a sudden our, our uh, compression rate went from 4x x to 8x. We double it again, simply because we're, we're um, using twice as many dimensions per segment. So quality. Um, if we're looking at this um, same data set, um, so here I've used four dimensions per segment. Um, in hindsight, it would have probably been better to also use one dimension per second because then we would have had a comparison for for um, for a four x reduction. But here, the point that I wanted to make is you can use PQ to get way higher amount of reduction and still get decent or decent ish recall. So the the eighty three point one percent may seem a bit low, but keep in mind this is before any kind of rescoring, and we'll we'll see. Um, in a in a second, the rescoring really can save a lot here. Just before rescoring, this is kind of a so sorry old slide, different data set. This is the one slide, or this in the next slide, or the two slides that use a different data set. This uses the SIFT one twenty eight data set, um, which is just one hundred twenty eight dimensional, which is not too common these days. But it it shows the point that I wanted to make, which is um, 
on the right, you see that greenish line, which is one uh, dimension per segment. Then the orange line is two dimensions per segment. Yellow is four. And then this um, blue or teal color is, is uh, eight. And um, the Y axis is recall. And then the X axis is throughput. So there's also a difference between, between uh, throughput and recall. So kind of makes sense. The more we stuff into one of those segment IDs, the worse it, it gets. But, and here's the interesting thing, if we overfetch and rescore a bit, we can save this again. So um, on this one, ignore the, the orange and the green. We're just looking at the blue and the red. The blue is uncompressed. This is with HNSW right now, uh, uncompressed. And um, the red is compressed with just picking the, the optimal values for this case. And then we can see that um, if we zoom into the, the sort of bottom right. We can see that it almost gets like the, the maximum recall is a bit so sorry, the axes are flipped compared to the previous screen right now on the X axis, we have uh, the recall and on the Y axis, we have the throughput. So you can see that you can almost get to the same recall and still keep a decent throughput. So if they diverge a bit as it, as it gets more and more. So quick summary of PQ. It has a very dynamic rate of compression because it mainly depends on how many dimensions we're stuffing into, into um, one segment. This again sort of makes it interesting if we're dealing with vectors of different dimensionality. So OpenAI with 1536 typically works best, I think, with around six to eight uh, uh, dimensions per segment, which is then 24 to 32 X compression. Uh, a shorter vector embedding would work better with maybe two to four dimensions per, per segment. So this is nice because it gives us the ability to sort of adjust this a bit. And, and then of course we, we, we actually have a very simple heuristic in, in VV8 that just looks at the dimensions of the, the models and then automatically chooses a default. You can of course override it if you want it, but um, it, it works surprisingly well to just sort of, yeah, extrapolate from the, the dimensionality. We can get still get decent recalls. So yes, it dropped down to 80 something, but that was before rescoring. If we do rescore, then, then uh, we can save it again. And in our case, and this was also why we chose to implement it first, it's a very good sort of overall fit compromise between yes, performance drops a bit, but we can get quite some drastic memory use. We can still keep the recall okay enough. So it's, it's sort of a, um, yeah, a, 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 a check of all trades in a, in a sense, kind of it works well for, for many cases. Downsides, the biggest downside probably to uh, product quantization is that it's relatively expensive to build. So you need to do the K-means kind of, uh, um, um, or, or K-means is just one option, but you need to do some kind of clustering algorithm. K-means works okay, there are others, um, but they're all costly. They're especially costly because they they, I'm not sure how k-means actually scales, but I think not very well. Uh, they become really costly with very large data sets. What you can do, of course, is you can sample your data set and then it still becomes somewhat representative. But even if you have the best possible sample, if your data drifts over time, at some point your sample might not be representative anymore. So then um, you need to, you're, the, the only option you have is basically to re-quantize and that's a pretty expensive step if you, if you um, have a large data set. Um, yeah, and the, the other point I basically just mentioned it, it is a relatively expensive distance calculation, especially compared to those very cheap ones that we have in, in scalar and locally adaptive quantization. So, oh, I thought I had one more graph, but I think I have this in binary quantization where we, we, we um, sort of look at, at um, product quantization again. Yeah, as I said, product quantization has been the first option that we had in, in VV8 and is in GA right now. I'm looking at the time, but this is a relatively small section. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll make it through in a second. And kind of the idea or, or one of the, the things with binary quantization is how far can we take this idea? Like how much stuff can we drop and still get decent results? Like in a sense, it's almost, can we take our, our ax or a sledgehammer or something to our vector and just really try and take it to the extreme and see if it still works. And this is, when I saw this the first time, I was always thought like, this, this has got to be a joke. Like, this can't possibly work. But surprise, surprise, it kind of does. So what we see here is we're discarding any information about the vector other than its sign 
Is it a positive or is it a negative value? And yes, we're losing a lot of information, but if we have 15, 36 or so dimensions, well, there is, there is um, yeah, still a lot of information in this. So the, the reduction here is 32X. We're replacing an entire float with just one bit. Um, so fixed 32X reduction. Does this work? So this slide would say kind of no, um, but the next slide will will say kind of yes. <laughs> so we we do drop down to just sixty four point five percent before rescoring. So considering that this is before rescoring, this is actually still kind of good. Because then if we look at um, actually same data set but with a million embeddings, so so ten um, x the the regular data set or ten x the one that we have on on this slide. And here we have a three-way comparison, again, with using HNSW. This is actually done with, with WeV8. Um, you can see that we get values in, I don't know, 90% or so recall if we include rescoring. Obviously, the performance drops because for rescoring, we need to hit the disk. Um, but these are still pretty good throughput numbers on, I don't actually know what, what kind of machine this was, but I think this was run on someone's MacBook or, or so. So definitely... Let, let, let's assume like eight CPU cores and a somewhat decent SSD drive. And then in here, we, we, we can see sort of compared to uncompressed HNSW that thus reached the highest recall in this case. So the only drop-off that you have here is because it's HNSW is an approximate index. Um, PQ comes very close. BQ doesn't come quite as close for, for the super high recall. So I don't know, let's say this is uh, if this is 97.5, I don't know, it's probably 98, where the others are 99 or so. So it doesn't come quite as close, but still very close. And this is then again, just the sort of, okay, what what do you need and what fits your data set? And especially as we go to the like lower recall range, it is just very performant. And maybe sort of also historically, we've put a lot of effort into optimizing the regular distance calculation. So there's all kind of SIMD stuff, et cetera, running for HNSW. This BQ here is completely unoptimized. This is just the standard kind of stuff that you get from the, from the compiler. The previous question of, could the model creators not just also make use of exactly this? This is what in this case Cohere is doing with binary quantization. So the, the latest models, they work for, they, they actually give you different options. And from what I understand in their loss function, they're not just training for the loss with one, but basically for, for all of these. And what that helps is sort of find the right centers for these dimensions so that the sign becomes more significant because yeah, 32 bits is still a lot of data. And if you have this right in the model, then you can actually get as they say, sort of better, better recall um, without having to do the, the quantization yourself. So this is something that we're currently looking into. You can't do this just yet with WeV8 because WeV8 sort of the APIs in WeV8 currently expect a float 32 based vector, um, but this is super interesting. And this is definitely something that, that will be coming in the future too. So quick recap on, on binary quantization, fixed 32X reduction, it is a very, very cheap distance calculation. It's just a pop count instruction because you're you're just sort of comparing bits that overlap into vectors. No fitting required at all, which also means there is no dis no risk of, of data drift. Um, yeah, as we just saw with Cohere, it can be used as a loss function in, in models, which then means the model works better with these with binary quantization, even without rescoring. And um, we like it a lot for multi-tenant use cases because in multi-tenant use cases, you tend to have very small data sets. And that also is one way to increase the, the accuracy. And then with some minimal re-ranking. So if you have say many tenants of a thousand to maybe 5,000 or so vector embeddings, um, we can just run them completely on disk because the, the um, BQ footprint makes them smaller. And then we have much less data to, risk, uh, to, to read from disk. And that works really well in, in practice. Yeah, on the, on the downsides, it has the lowest recall out of all the things that we um, compared here. But as we just saw on that slide, you can make up for this by, by just rescoring. And especially if you're willing to give up some throughput and are okay with hitting the disk, you can, you can um, yeah, f uh, improve it quite a bit. Um, yeah, the other thing is the viability of this basically depends on 
how are your vector embeddings centered and which dimensions are the most significant for your use case? So this is also out of domain is a bit of an, an interesting topic. If, if you think of having a global model that tries to fit every single concept in the world. So say a model that has been trained on Wikipedia that needs to basically work with everything there is. But then if you're in a specific industry and your domain is a very small fraction of that, that data, how many of those embeddings represent your data? So the more, the closer the model is trained to your data set, the better it will work because the, the more you can make use of the entire dimensional space as opposed to, to um, just fractions of it. Binary quantization is, is generally available in, in WeV8. The only thing that's missing is sort of um, the integration with external uh, models that already use quantization directly that will be, be coming in the future as well. Okay, quick recap. I know we're slightly over time, but I just want to, this is the last slide. Um, so scalar quantization, fixed 4x reduction, very good performance compression trade-off. Locally adaptive quantization is essentially just taking scalar quantization and fitting it closer to the model, um, which gives you slightly higher reduction and, and very high recall. So as we saw, highest recall without rescoring. Product quantization, very versatile. We, we can use it on, on um, most data sets. You can sort of fit it to the dimensionality of the data set. You would get at least a 4x reduction. Typically, we see in an 8x reduction to sort of 24 or so being the, the sweet spot, 32. Technically, it could go higher, but I don't think I've seen higher than, than 32x. And it's very good for large, low-cost use cases that aren't super uh, throughput constrained. Uh, and then binary quantization. Yeah, it, it almost feels like it shouldn't work, but it does. <laughs> and especially with rescoring. And um, yeah, as I just said, works great in these multi-tenant use cases. Yeah, so... That's it from my side. Here are a couple of links for, for socials, et cetera. Um, but also, of course, very interested in hearing your questions and thoughts on, on anything really. If it's if it's related to those four quantization techniques, um, very interested in those, but also if it's more on, on Weaviate or on me or the company or so, feel free to, to ask. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Us? I wondered if you looked at all into uh, dimensions of different, like if two different dimensions are independent or dependent on each other and wondering if you could get any sort of quantization uh, using that as if to, right? You're saying that the smaller models sometimes perform better, so there might be uh, multiple dimensions that are highly dependent and you may be able to say do product quantization by finding dimensions that are very similar to each other and achieve better results that way. Very interesting idea. I have not specifically looked at this. I'm just thinking about since we're clustering in PQ, would yeah I'm wondering if if we're using a clustering algorithm if this would kind of happen happen itself. But no, I've not specifically looked at it. But I think this is this goes in the same direction of is the output of the models actually efficient? Or is there just yeah, patterns in there that um that are kind of redundant? But yeah, great, great point. <laughs> Definitely give that to our research team. Great. Any questions for I have a clarification question. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you mention that like for, I guess, less accurate quantization method, like uh, we're actually like overfetching or like, what did you say the method was? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the overfetching and then re-ranking with continuous vectors is a great way to sort of restore that recall. So what we see typically is if we're looking at say the recall for the top 10, then the number can drop quite drastically but that doesn't mean that the search itself was bad. It could just mean that the right results were at position 11 or 12 or 13 or so. So if we cut off exactly what we want to return to the user, it's almost like we're we're wasting the, the search results a bit because we did all this effort like either through the approximate nearest neighbor index or brute forcing it. 
and we got this like relatively good top 100 and it's actually just within those top 100 it's actually just in the wrong order and we're cutting it off at, at 10. so if we just overfetch in in this case from say 10 to 100 um it's often it's often much less than that in practice and then just rescore exactly those 100 and then cut off there this typically is is all that's needed to uh increase the accuracy quite a bit for the more lossy ones wait how how are we rescoring these, uh, I guess, uh, these better candidates? Yeah, typically um, against the original vector embeddings that we just read from disk. So kind of in, in, in WeV8, the process is a bit, um, you do the, the original search in memory and in HNSW, what you have is you have this candidate list, which is always larger than than the final search results. So in, let's say you have the limit of 10 and then you have this, this quality parameter, it's called uh, EF in, in the context of, of, um, of HNSW. And then you'd have say 64. That means during your entire search, you have this candidate set of 64. And then at the very end of the search, um, when we're basically at the step where we need to retrieve the actual objects from disk. So we run the, the similarity search in, in memory, but then we would um, retrieve the, disk, uh, the, the, the objects from disk because we want to serve the full objects to the user. That is the step where we then read the vector embedding as well. And then um, we use the sort of just the original, what the model spit out kind of embedding just as a mini sort of brute force on whatever we overfetch on. In this case, 64 embeddings, we just do like a similarity search and essentially reorder those 64 candidates that we already identified. Great. Any further questions? Uh, so out of curiosity, I wonder if you ever looking to you know trying a different numerical format. So for example, swapping out bullet point with like posits, which usually has like higher accuracy um, guarantee, and see like how does that affect the quantization? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? When swapping out, uh, yeah. So you try, like, try a different uh, numerical format. Uh, yeah. So trying a different numerical format. So for example, swapping out floating point with like posits, for example. Uh, and see how does that affect quantizations uh, accuracy. So you mean before the quantization, just take say the original float embedding and and yes. just convert it to an int already or so, and then run the quantization. Yeah, int or like a more sophisticated um, numerical format. Yeah, haven't haven't tried it. Um, I think in a sense the scalar quantization comes quite close to that concept, um, but no, I haven't tried a, a more sophisticated one. Any other questions? Uh, I have one question, maybe it's a high level question, but I'm, I'm curious how your uh, customers think about recall, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, when they come to you, do they come with this specific performance target that they want to meet? And then given that they want to get the best recall or they really care about achieving a specific recall? And if so, the recall studies that I see generally focus on the average recall and doesn't say anything about individual queries. Each individual query might have terrible recall, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about how, how people think about recall versus performance in, in real world applications? Yeah. The simple answer is every single customer is different. <laughs> so we have, I think we have all extremes. We have some that are so focused on performance numbers that they're very easily willing to, to take a lower recall. We have some that are happy to say, I'm not using any quantization technique because I just want to get the maximum recall. And if I have to pay 4X or so because it costs 4X more, that's that's fine. So we have that end of the, the extreme. We have some users who I would say are more from a, from a traditional information retrieval background who look at this more end-to-end. -end. So they don't necessarily care so much about um, what is the, the yeah, as we said before, what is the, the recall compared to the perfect recall with this model, which could already be flawed, but they're looking at some kind of accuracy benchmark or so that they've developed themselves or, or NDCG, sort of the, the, the more traditional metrics. Um, 
yeah and and everything in between <laughs> so it's it's uh, th there's no one size fit all it fits all and it it really varies some are more on the performance side some are more on the on the accuracy accuracy side and some i think know very well how to calculate this like with very sophisticated like, like if if the company that uses weviate um if, if their model is basically giving the best possible answer so like your your typical rack kind of application they tend to care a lot and they they sort of there are so many things that can influence accuracy besides the similarity search so chunking for example such a big topic and and these kind of players that have like very complex chunking strategies or, or tokenization strategies and all of these things they tend to have more sophisticated accuracy benchmarks whereas others um yeah let's say e-commerce for e-commerce in the end it's just conversion rate they just do tests and if changing this parameter somehow changes the conversion rate then we want to change this parameter and we look at what does it cost and does it like is is the additional cost justified so um yeah in in, in summary there's really no one answer it really depends on on the different user their experience their industry well um uh, maybe i'll um I'll ask the final question. Uh, again, this is a high level question, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on where the vector databases are going. Um, in other words, embeddings are here to stay. Uh, so clearly the traditional database systems are putting in embedding support, vector support, and so on, like Postgres, for example, is, uh, has done recently. And of course, vector databases are coming from the other direction. So you guys have support for vectors now, pretty much exclusive support. But then I would think that, you know, as you start working with real customers, developing real full-fledged applications, you'd want to also support you know, more structured data types, relational data, et cetera, et cetera. And at some point, you know, in the horizon, there's going to be some sort of a convergence uh, that might happen, just like what happened with NoSQL databases, document databases, and so on. So, how do you how do you see things as unfolding? Uh, is that is that sort of a valid speculation in terms of how the two worlds will sort of uh, proceed forward and converge at some point, or do you feel like vector databases are going to remain as a very sort of uh, important but kind of a niche um, data support system? Yeah, great, great question. I think there's, again, multiple sides to this. One is the sort of almost not so much on the tech, but more on the UX and how do you interact with the database kind of side, where for us, we try to go in the direction of whatever is the AI native approach. So not necessarily trying to rebuild something that, that existing search systems have. Yes, we do need to add those those features because as you say, sometimes they're expected. So e-commerce, great example of where you just have these very specific sort of structured things that that, that are necessary. Um, but also the, the, the whole idea of potentially bringing the model closer to the database. Like can we, so, so generative feedback loops, for example, is one of these concepts where the idea is that the model is not just used for retrieval, but maybe the model can also be used, for example, for enriching your data or for ingesting it, for, for cleaning up your data. So these kind of flows that are sort of closer to the model than to a traditional database. I think this is something that um, for us, it just makes sense to, to a degree, like a traditional database has to at some point make a decision, like, is this just sort of the bells and whistle on top, but we can't really change our core thing or is this a different core thing? And for us, since we're coming from this from a different direction, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Then more on the tech side, um, since the, the, the sort of challenges that we see with vector databases are different, this also pushes us to slightly different architectures that you can't easily sort of incorporate in a, in a traditional database. So multi-tenancy is a great example um, with these, large sort of, if you have a large monolithic vector index, it performs very, very poorly if you narrow it down to, to say 0.01% um, of the data set or so if that represents one tenant. Whereas in in traditional databases, not an issue whatsoever. It actually becomes more efficient if you have an index for this and you can narrow it down to, to something. So that leads to, to different architectures on that side. And if you then combine this with say, um, 
sort of a more uh, separation of storage and compute focused industry, this again opens up different path. So yes, there are a lot of similarities and, and obviously all the, all the existing databases need to add vector indexes because this is what people ask for. But I think I don't think that they're fully going to converge. I think, yes, there are cases that you'll be able to run with your all-purpose database that can also do vector search. But sort of the more specialized cases and the more AI native and AI driven cases, I think these are this is more the direction how yeah, how the vector database industry is going to make sure that there's a, a justification for a vector databases as opposed to um, having similarity search become commoditized. Great. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, this was a great discussion of quantization and vector databases. And this was the most academic talk that I've ever heard from a company person, especially a CTO. So uh, thank you for that, too. And thank you. Thanks to your colleagues for attending. Um, and let's give Etienne another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't overpromise on that this would not be a sales presentation. <laughs> no, no, it was great. Thank you so much, Etienne. I, uh, I'll be in touch. And Thank if you. you. Want, uh, Thanks again for, for inviting me. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great Thank day, you. everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. <laughs>